So what's the software stack look like on the Forbidden Router? Well, it's really exciting. It doesn't even have to be on the Forbidden Router. We've talked about it before. We're gonna update it some. There's a how-to guide on the forum. This is so cool. Check this out. Humor me for a second. Let's go to MSN. Okay, we're on MSN, but all, all the ads are missing? What, what have you done with the ads? They're in a black hole, or a pie hole, I should say. Pie hole is so cool. But also, what about Steam? I'm downloading at Steam at 90 megabytes per second. That's not even impressive, that's gigabit speed. What if you could download from Steam at 10 gigabit speed? You can do that with this setup. I'm gonna show you how. The Forbidden Router, part two. So here's our setup. If you saw last time, we set up PFSense as a virtual machine, which is a little bit of a no-no, not recommended. You don't have to do that. If you have a hardware PFSense machine, this will work just the same. But the next step, we're gonna configure a Linux machine. I've selected Alma Linux. And if you're following along, I'm assuming that you know how to do the Linux thing and you can do the command line, but it's not a terrible first-ish project with Linux. So, Alma Linux. Basically, you log into your XCPNG management UI and you create a virtual machine and you download the Alma Linux ISO that's in the in the guide on the level one forum. I just use wget to dump it in the in the folder. Not a big deal. At a, a very high level, what we're gonna do is set up Pihole, which does DNS filtering for ads and a little bit of malware filtering, but it also gives you control over it. So it gives you a, a web management GUI to do some fun stuff. I really think that routers need to build in this technology. There's no reason that you know, uh, Asus or Netgear or somebody like that is not selling you something that can run these little Docker containers because it's so cool, it's so handy. You can customize your router to do whatever you want. But what it's doing is filtering ads and ads can be a vector for malware. And doing this at the router level is really super awesome and it's really not super hard. But I want it to go fast and the Forbidden Router is using those F-series Epic CPUs. So we start with Linux we can run containers, Docker containers. So we set up Alma Linux, we configure Docker, and then the first Docker container that we set up, other than Hello World, because we need to make sure that everything's actually working, is called Portainer. Portainer is an incredible GUI for Docker. And if you're not using this for a home setup or something like that, you should definitely give them a few bucks or subscribe to one of their more commercial offerings because Portainer really makes your life a lot easier if you have to manage these things. Oh, and I should, quickly have an aside in the red hat ecosystem they're working to replace docker with something called podman and we've talked about that a little bit on the level one forum and there's a lot of really interesting stuff podman is an incredible replacement for docker it uh you know the docker people have made some changes because they're trying to make money and commercialize things with it red hat is also in this whole cloud hosting business so they're offering podman as basically a drop-in replacement for Docker. And if you want to go the Red Hat Enterprise Linux route, Red Hat does actually offer 16 free licenses for usage. And you can do pretty much all of this with Portainer. There's a couple of gotchas, there's a couple of pitfalls that you might fall into. This is basically ready-made to go on Alma Linux 9. And that's because Red Hat 9 with Docker CE, they're having a little spat and uh, there weren't really usable sources for that for a while. But anyway, so there's a Docker container, a Docker Compose script, which will create one or more Docker containers as needed for the solution. We've got that for Pi-hole, and we've got that for LAN cache, which does Steam caching. Not just Steam, but also uh, Windows updates that are unencrypted, Blizzard, basically anything that's not encrypted that has to do with games. There's a list of servers that it replaces. You can check that out in the form if you wanna know exactly what it does. The how-to guide will link you to the DNS that it takes over, but it's doing all this magic through DNS. And DNS is a separate conversation that we need to have. If we're gonna have this conversation about Steam Cache and Pi-hole, we have to have a larger conversation about DNS, because DNS is important. It's always DNS when you're troubleshooting. DNS benchmarking is kind of weird because it's not something a lot of people talk about, but if your DNS performance is bad, anything that you do on the internet is gonna feel weird and sluggish. So what do I mean by that? It's like when you click on a link on a web page, how quickly it does something, if DNS is slow, 
your whole connection is going to be slow, even if you can download files really fast, or if it feels like you can download files really fast. Steam's moving at 100 megabytes per second, the full you know, bandwidth that you would get from gigabit speed, but you click on a website and it's slow, that's probably DNS. Intermittent weird problems, it's probably DNS. It's kind of a joke among system administrators. It's like, there's no way it can be DNS. Oh yeah, no, totally turns out it was in fact DNS. Steam Cache and Pi-hole both mess with DNS. They are both DNS services. And as far as I know, there's not a container that contains services for both what Pi-hole does and what Steam Cache does. And if you look at how those things work, they depend on DNS manipulation. Starting with Steam Cache. If we talk about how Steam Cache works, it's a huge list of uh, DNS names and I call it Steam Cache, but it's really not Steam Cache anymore. It's based on a, a project called Steam Cache that became LAN, LAN Cache, became something else. But this project doesn't actually even maintain its own list of DNS names uh, to be messed with. And so uh, what it does is it takes this list of DNS names, you know, certain website URLs like google.com is a DNS name. And there are known DNS names for Windows updates and Steam game updates and Steam powered and like the Steam powered store and updates and all this other kind of stuff. And instead of sending you to Valve or sending you to Microsoft or sending you to whatever, it sends those to your Steam cache appliance or your LAN cache appliance where things hopefully are cached. And then that thing knows what the real addresses are and it'll reach out and grab them. This is totally normal. In fact, uh, ISPs uh, often will host their own Steam cache system. Uh, Ryan's ISP hosts a Steam Cache server. The problem is that it's garbage and overloaded. And so it's much faster if he bypasses that using a third party DNS service than it is to use his ISP Steam Cache because his IS ISP Steam Cache tops out at downloads of, of like a megabyte per second. And if he just doesn't use his ISP's DNS server, then those things will come in at more like 100 megabytes per second instead of one. And that's basically what we're doing here with DNS, DNS manipulation. So we manipulate DNS so that the files will try to come from the local cache first before they come from Valve. Same kind of thing with Pi-hole, except instead of speeding things up, we want to block things that we don't need, which will speed everything else up. So how we have to set this up is basically a hierarchy. We have to do a DNS lookup and then pass that request. It's like, hey, where's Google? It's like, okay, that's not Valve. I'll pass that on. And then it's like, oh, that's not, you know, pie hole, I'll pass that on. Or, oh, that's not whatever, I'll pass that on. It would be better if one resolver could resolve both things, where something in, say, pie hole DNS knew that Steam was a thing and it was in the local database and it would handle it. But since that's not a thing, we have to string together two different things. And it ends up being a little weird because when your computer goes to look up google.com, it'll have to check first the local pie hole and then the Steam cache, and then your ISP's DNS server, and then one farther out on the internet. This introduces a lot of potential for DNS to break. And so I wanna show you DNS benchmarking first without this video getting overly long, because I don't want a whole separate other video about DNS. But suffice it to say, on Windows, pretty much the best DNS benchmarking utility is DNS Bench, which is freeware from GRC, Steve Gibson, you might've heard that name before. It's a really smart guy, works on a lot of stuff. But DNS Benchmark is a great Windows GUI for doing this kind of thing. Google themselves actually came out with a, a utility called NameBench, which is for the CLI. You can get binaries for that for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. There's some replacements for NameBench. You can just Google NameBench replacement because it's been like eight years since Google updated that. And what those programs do is they run a bunch of DNS queries against the uh, public list of resolvers. You know, Google provides some public DNS in case your ISP is that level of trash. Uh, MCI, Sprint Link, there's a whole bunch of free DNS servers that uh, provide the service because they're able to sort of look at what you do and harvest traffic and say, oh, there's a lot of people that are going to Google and Bing Maps and, you know, whatever. And maybe there's some marketing data that can be sold there based on DNS lookups. So this will run benchmarks against a whole bunch of them. You should definitely customize this list and add your ISP's DNS servers to this list as well as other uh, IPs around it that may res respond to your queries. Not any DNS server will respond to any query from any IP address. If you just 
you know, use an arbitrary name server's IP address and it doesn't trust your IP address, it may just ignore you or it may work for a little while and then you'll get blocked. So uh, there's some caveats, there's some gotchas, but you absolutely need to be able to measure your DNS latency in order to understand the effect that you're having on the network. So in the graph here, it's showing us some different colors and uh, response time. The bigger the green bar, the worse it is. You wanna check the checkbox that puts the fastest at the top because the fastest at the top is what you want. Sprintlink, level three, ultra DNS, Cloudflare, open DNS, Google and Quad9. Those are just some of the, the free DNS providers, but this is by no means comprehensive. And in fact, you definitely shouldn't run with this list. You should try to add your ISPs DNS servers in here and maybe their ISPs DNS servers because hey, if your ISP uses Sprintlink or level three, you might be able to use their DNS servers. And they might be faster than your ISP's DNS servers. You just have to check. It may very well be that your ISP's DNS servers aren't very good and adding Steam Cache plus Pi-hole to your network doesn't really make any negligible difference. However, there are some people that will run Pi-hole on a Raspberry Pi, and there's nothing wrong with that. But my network is kind of big. There's a lot of DNS traffic. And a Raspberry Pi doesn't really respond fast enough compared to something that's like an air fire breathing forbidden router with its, you know, epic F series CPUs. So it would uh, negatively impact my performance to use a Raspberry Pi because a Raspberry Pi can't service those DNS requests in microseconds, which is what I want. I want that snappy awesomeness. Also want kind of a large cache because, well, it makes things go faster. Steve Gibson's DNS benchmarking utility is great because it walks you through all this and if you read it, it tells you everything that I just told you. So it'll sort of walk you through it, it's really good. At the command line interface, you don't necessarily get that level of hand-holding, but I told you everything you needed to know. You're gonna have to dot the I's and cross the T's, come to the level one forums if you get stuck. But this is something that you should know before embarking on configuring the DNS hierarchy. Oh, and if you're really precocious and you've set up a uh, Windows home network with Active Directory, it turns out your Active Directory controllers also want to be your DNS servers. So if you're thinking about implementing this on your homeland or you've got a small business server or something with Active Directory or Azure Active Directory, uh, the DNS settings matter a whole bunch. But uh, yeah, we don't need to worry about that for this video. All we need to do is get our virtual machine set up get our containers set up on the virtual machine for Pi-hole and Steam Cache, and we're off to the races. But this is everything you need to know about DNS in about 10 minutes. So now that you've got a cursory understanding of DNS and how important it is for your network, and you understand what's going on here, we will set up Steam Cache as sort of the first thing, and then Steam Cache's upstream DNS server will be Pi-hole. So when your computers do a DNS lookup, they'll hit the container for Steam Cache first, and then see if there's anything, oh, is this a Steam related request? No, okay, we'll travel up the hierarchy and then we'll go up the hierarchy to your ISP's DNS server or whatever DNS server you found is actually faster using your DNS benchmarking utility. So you gotta figure out which DNS server is faster because we're sort of chaining these things together. And yes, technically it would be better if we had a single DNS server that combined the uh, LAN cache capabilities with Pi-hole. Uh, one would only hope that Pi-hole, uh, the Pi-hole people do a plug-in or an extension system or something so that we can bring in that list of uh, DNS IP addresses that need to be redirected to the local uh, LAN cache monolithic. If you look into the Docker Compose file for LAN cache, it's actually two containers, one for DNS and one for proxying the files. Now for my setup, I'm still working on this rack mount system. Look, it's just splayed out all over the desk here. I'm gonna do another video with the actual physical hardware build. I'm hoping that we end up with an enormous amount of flash, maybe some mechanical storage, but depending on what your parameters are is how much you wanna cache. And you, you probably do wanna cache two, three, four, 20 terabytes of games on Steam so that when you go to download those games, it's gonna be really fast. So don't worry, it'll cache the updates and, and everything else. But you have to configure that through the container file um, that's posted on the level one forum and it walks you through doing that in Portainer. So as you go through the Portainer GUI, it's really not complicated. So at the end of the day, when you're done in the XCPNG interface, we've got the Alma Linux 8 virtual machine. And then we've got the Portainer web GUI, which shows we're running Pi-hole, LanCache monolithic, LanCache DNS, and then the container for Portainer itself. We're running 
portainer in a container. Isn't that really cool? The links for Lancash Monolithic don't do anything because it's expecting an outbound HTTP request because it's a proxy, so there's not really a web GUI for the Lancash part of it. But if you want to verify that it's working, you can go to the console and run tail-f on the logs and see if you're getting hits and misses on the cache. A hit means that it came from local and a miss means that it missed and it has to go to the internet and get it. And the Pi-hole web GUI will show you what sort of DNS traffic it's seeing and, and what ads it's blocked and all of that sort of stuff. Currently there's 143,000 domains on the ad list. Oh, the ad networks have been busy. Pi-hole is a community project and they do have a donate link at the bottom that I'll call attention to. If you try this and your mind is blown about how much better your internet experience is because you're blocking a lot of ad scripts and trackers and things like that, definitely send Pi-hole some money because hey, that's a thing. There's another aspect of that in that some creators get paid via ads, but the risk of malware and the stewardship of how well those ads are taken care of is maybe a conversation for another day. And hey, sometimes in these videos we bake in a sponsor spot and this is not going to, not going to do anything with that, obviously. It's just the, the random other crap. It's not really the anti-ad part of this that I'm interested in. It's more ads as a vector for malware and basically shutting that down before it has a chance to take over. And for that, this is amazing. And there you have it. That's pretty much all there is to it. You do want to set this virtual machine to start automatically, and you do want to reconfigure PFSense, your DHCP server, probably, to hand out the IP address that you set of the container, of the uh, Steam cache or LAN cache container in your DHCP server. Because your DHCP server is what your computers use to uh, automatically know what settings to use on the network. And so in the DHCP server, you can configure the IP address. Now normally PFSense sets itself and it's got a little cache and then it'll use whatever DNS servers your ISP gave you. But if you do the DNS benchmarks, you may find that your, your ISP's DNS is basically garbage, like I was saying, and so you'll want to use something that's faster. There's no, there's no real downside for that, except that the person that you're using for DNS traffic can see your DNS queries. And it's also a little bit of a wild card with something like Firefox, because Firefox will do DNS over HTTP, and so those queries may not actually go through Pi-hole. You may have to turn off DNS over HTTP if you want Pi-hole to do the filtering, because that is a different mechanism and works a little differently. And again, if you get lost or there's, I'm speaking some kind of crazy moon language, come to the level one forum and I'll try to help you. But Generally, this is pretty good, and Portainer is a really slick GUI for managing Docker. You don't have to drop to the command line and copy-paste and do all this other kind of stuff. It just works, generally, and that's really, really awesome. Plus also being able to download your Steam games that you've got cached at basically wire speed as fast as you would copy them off a of NAS. Also very nice, without having to think about it. It just works. And not just Steam, Epic, and a whole bunch of other things. You can check the level one guy. There's a little block there that shows you exactly what it does. But I'm Wendell, this is level one. This has been the Forbidden Router part two. Part three, we're gonna put it in a nice little physical package. Cause like I say, it's just splayed out all over the desk. You can hear it in the background. It doesn't have a case, it doesn't have a body. It's just laying there on the desk. I'm Wendell, this is level one. I'm signing out. You can find me in the level one forums.